Would you pray with me, please? Father God, I thank you so much for joyful worship, Lord. I, I thank you for an opportunity on a, on a morning that's cold and windy, Lord, that we can feel fire, holy fire, and I thank you for that, Lord. I, I ask as we come before your word today that you would use it with power over our lives, not just to change us, Lord, but grant us vision. Vision is a church for who you're calling us to be as one body, Lord. Uh, there are many individuals here, each one living out a faithful life to you according to your word and the power of the Holy Spirit. But amazingly, we all work together as one. So Lord, help grant us the vision as a church, your vision, the one you gave many years ago to this church and the one you're giving us for the future. So we love you, Jesus. We pray all this in your name, Lord. Amen. I want to take time today, as I, as I said earlier, and, I, and, and I've kind of let people know, usually the first Sunday of the year, I like to kind of take time to remind us as a church. Now, last week I talked to you about kind of this theology of the church. Uh, you got to get beyond this, this individual mindset. Uh, the body, the, 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 the Bible describes the church as one body. Uh, each of you uh, in faith, living a life of faithfulness, but yet somehow amazingly unified by the Holy Spirit uh, to where we act as one, uh, one church. And, and I want to talk to you about vision, uh, because quite frankly, I, I, you know, a lot of people kind of think that the purpose of a church, and I'm paraphrasing here, so forgive me if, if this isn't you, that, then let it, let it go, but I'm, I'm generalizing but a lot of people kind of have this approach to church. It's a place where I go every so often to maybe hear something that's encouraging and then kind of get back to my life. Well, that is not what a church is. And I will tell you that I, I see many, many people that live life that way. And I actually feel sorry for them because there is this abundance in God that is so much more than what people accept and they live in their lives. You see, the church ultimately is this amazing thing that Jesus Christ, it's this body of Christ here in the world. And when we actually become a part of that body, we collectively get to do things that are amazing and mind boggling. I, I, I want to I kind of just for a minute, before we get to any scripture today, I want to talk to you about a word called influence, and it's a very, very important word, and you have to understand, and, and see, we, we can poo-poo this or ignore it all we want to, but this is going on nonetheless. You are being bombarded with all kinds of different influences. There are influences coming at you from every angle. I want to give you an example of something that I witnessed at a leadership uh, a leadership training seminar at one time about the power of influence in marketing. They took a they took a group of school age children and they put them in a room, uh, and uh, you know like a classroom, and they had them doing all kinds of various activities. Now, without actually sitting each child down and telling them anything, they actually just they surround they they put in that room pictures on the walls. And, and these pictures were, the first group of kids uh, that, were, that were doing activities in this room, they were surrounded with pictures of kids eating candy. And they'd have these big smiles on their faces, and they'd be eating candy bars and candy. And, and that was all it was, just pictures of kids eating candy. Well, after the activity was over with, during the activity, the kids actually, uh, they, they, they received reward points that they could cash in at a store, a store, where they offered all kinds of different things. Well, guess what the first group primarily wanted? At the end, all they wanted was candy. And so that first group, without anything being said to them, they went and they used all their reward points to choose candy. Now, the second group, they were in this classroom doing activities, and everything on the wall, they were surrounded by images of kids coloring and kids doing puzzles and, and things like that. Well, after their time was done and they had their store points, what did they buy? They bought puzzles and colors and markers. And so the whole point of it all in, in marketing 
is that all they have to do is that you're, you are constantly being influenced by things around you. And, and you have to know that's happening. And I'm telling you that primarily the influences around you are not godly. You, you're, you're, getting, you're getting bombarded by things that are trying to draw you away from God continuously. So, that being said, what do you suppose is God's primary influence in this world to bring people to him? It's the church. And when the church is not being the church, we are not being an influence in the culture. And so, so here we have, we, have a, we have a region, Newton and the surrounding communities and all these areas that, that have been gut punched and a lot, of, a lot of financial difficulty, a lot of hard times in this area. And a lot of, a lot of discouragement, a lot of depression. Well, how do we influence that? See, now you're starting to understand the vision for the way. We don't just want you to come here, play church, go home, and live your lives the rest of the week. We want you to be the church. We want you that when you're out there, you're going to be an influence that's going to offer people hope and encouragement and somehow, some way, combat what's going on in our culture. But when people are, when they're, when, when they're just nominal Christians and they're being influenced by everything but the church, they're powerless, and nothing happens. So we talk about the, we talk about the, the vision of the way. It's not enough. We, we don't just want to be a church, that, like the typical church. We want to be a juggernaut of influence within the region for the kingdom of God. The question you have to ask yourself is, how are you participating in that? Are you an influence for the kingdom of God, or are you just... A spectator of what God is doing. So I want to I want to kind of take some time to kind of go over a vision. I want to I want to take you first to the great commission, the vision of all visions. In Matthew 28, Brian, if you'd pull that up for me. These are the words of Jesus to the disciples after his resurrection, before his ascension to heaven. And as a Christian, this is a broad governing command from Christ. For all of us, okay? So uh, it doesn't matter if you are a Christian, a disciple, a follower of Christ, this is his command for you. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given you, and be sure of this, I am with you always even to the end of the age. This is the Great Commission. Jesus did not say, go live an enhanced life. He did not say, go and do whatever you want. He said, go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Gut check question. Is there something inside of you that wants people to know Jesus? Or do you not care? Because this is, this is the great commission that our Lord has commanded us to do. Now, everything that we do as believers is filtered through this. The way you do your jobs, the way you do anything. Th this, this, is, this is the great commission. So everything falls back to here, teaching people to obey his commands. And Jesus says that when you do this, I'll be with you forever. Because this is what, I, this is what I'm doing so if you're doing this, I'm with you. And so that, that's where we begin. Now, now, now we're going to try to rein this in specifically to us as a church here at The Way. I, I want to take you to our mission statement, our vision statement. Now, quick question. How many of you, if I, say, if I say to you, what's our mission statement, how many of you can say it? <laughs> Remember all those the, the way back when I would challenge us every week to, to, for our mission and vision? Our mission to seek, invite, and welcome people into the unconditional love of God and to share with them the good news about Jesus Christ who is the way, the truth, and the life. So we are constantly, the way that we, the way that we specifically take the Great Commission and apply it to us as a church is we are continually reaching out and seeking people. And everything, every decision that we make 
is all about reaching people for the kingdom of God. Obviously, we want to minister to the saints, the believers, and we do. But our primary focus is on reaching out to others. So every so often, if there's any kind of a conflict uh, in, in thinking between uh, the, the, the ministering to the church people or being an outreach evangelistic, reaching out to people, if ever there's a conflict in that, guess which one's going to win? Now, for a lot of churches, it's exactly the opposite. They're more about the people that are there than reaching out to new people and, and inviting them to Christ. And I can tell you that as that happens, a church dies. And they don't even realize it. Because, why? It's not the Great Commission. The Great Commission is not to have the best church you can get together and do things over and over just collectively as a group and, and just be together and don't, don't allow anybody outside in. Just, just hoard what you have. That, that's not the Great Commission. And then church, it's amazing. Churches are like, well, I don't understand why we're losing attendance and we're dying. Well, you're not doing what Jesus Christ has commanded you to do. Try doing the Great Commission and see how things start to change. This is who we are. And as I, as I tell people, there are certain hills in my life that I will die on. This is one of them. This is one of them. I will not compromise on being a part of the Great Commission. This is the mission that Jesus Christ himself gave to the way. And this is who we are. Now, our vision, to kind of expand on that, is to share biblical truth in a culturally relevant way for people that genuinely seek to know the one true God by following and worshiping the way, Jesus Christ. We will never compromise on the truth of Scripture. Because theologically, there, there's a power in the Word. And it's not for me to somehow uh, uh, alter Scripture so that it's more acceptable to people. I will always, I always present the Bible truthfully, without apology, and without any kind of hesitation. But that being said, I will present it in a way, hopefully, that you can relate to it, in a culturally relevant way. Uh, one of the things that a lot of people will tell me, I hear this quite frequently, is that, is, you know, especially people that have gone to church for a, for a while, uh, and, and, and new people like, they're like, well, I, I've, never, I've never heard it this way, and, and I've never really understood it like this until now. Well, that's great. That's exactly what we want. So if you've ever kind of had one of those, wow, I didn't know that was, I didn't, you know, if you've had those moments, that's exactly what we're trying to accomplish. But we're not trying to compromise on Scripture and, and the authority of Scripture. We're trying to, to stay faithful to the authority of Scripture. So, so as, as we talk about who we are as a, as a, as a church, as a body, this is it, and this is who we're going to be. And I will tell you that, that most of you would not be here if it weren't for that mission and that vision. How many of you, by a raise of hands, were here July the 12th, 2009, when the way began? I want to see, I'm just curious, how many of you were here? Okay, you look around. Let, what is that, less than 10%? That's when we began. So these are the new people. So every one of you that didn't raise your hand, you're the result of our mission and our vision. You're, you're part of this church. And that's, that's who we are. And, 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 so, and so we have to try to put these in perspective. We will never, ever, ever compromise. Again, if there's hills to die on, the mission and the vision are our hills to die on. It, it, so oftentimes a church has no idea what their mission and their vision is. And it's just some kind of ambiguous statement that's like, well, you know, we figured we had to have a mission statement, so we threw it out there. Well, it's not who we are. We come from kind of a different mindset. We, th this, this is something that we feel like God gave us, and we're going to stay true to it. So this is who we are. Now, I want to I wanna take some time just to kind of uh, give you a 10,000-foot a, a view, so to speak, of ministry here at the way I'm, i don't typically talk numbers to people here at the way because quite frankly they don't matter and later i'm going to read for you a scripture that it, it's more about a sincere heart than it is about any kind of size in ministry but every so often 
because we're four different services and we're segmented, we're kind of all over the place, we need to let people know collectively what's going on here. Uh, and so I, it's important that you understand, because, you know, sometimes you think, well, you know, how much influence can one person do? Well, how about, how about 600 people together as one body? See, and this is, this is the collective influence of the church. Uh, last summer, and actually over a year ago, before our last ministry year, I'm going to give you numbers. These come from our leadership team. Uh, but over a year ago, I challenged our leadership team heading into our last ministry year, uh, and again this year, to figure out ways to measure success. Uh, you know, because I think sometimes we just do things, we do things, we do things, and we don't really measure success. So I challenged them, and it could be anything within their ministry, but, but to pick something within their ministry that they can point to, challenge themselves, and actually say, yes, this, this is something that we can look at and we can measure our success by. And I want to kind of give you the results of our, at the end of our last year's ministry team uh, meeting, uh, the, kind of the results. So these, these numbers are actually uh, not quite a year old, uh, but, um, but, but they just give you a snapshot of where we are. Every number I'm telling you has increased this year. So uh, again, so the first one I want to tell you about is Tricia Groves, uh, who's the, who's, she, you know her maybe as our office manager, but you, she's also our youth, Route 146 youth group uh, leader. Um, she, uh, what she did is she challenged her leadership team within the ministry to do something that she called intentional reach outs. So intentional reach outs to the youth of the community, um, an intentional reach, reach out is defined as something more than just a hello. It was a conversation, maybe over lunch, or, or, or actually having a, a, a deliberate conversation, praying for the youth directly, or asking questions about their life, etc., things in their life. Actually, uh, you know, taking the time to do that. That was an intentional reach out. Well, last year, her team averaged 29 intentional reach outs a week to our youth of this community. 29 intentional reach outs a week, which is over one, th which is 1,073 for the year. 1,000 reach outs to the, to, the, to the youth of this community. Now again, I want to tell you, our kids are, are, you talk about a battle of influence. Well, here you have a group of people that are intentionally battling for our youth. And so, so this is just a snap, 1,000 times. That doesn't include, that doesn't include the weekly meeting and the small groups. This is on top of the general ministry, a reach out. Hey, how you doing? What's going on in your life? You know, th 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 these are amazing things. Over 1,000, uh, uh, over 15 le volunteers, leadership team, uh, on, you know, leaders within the youth ministry, 15 to 20 volunteers, uh, numbers, uh, 50, 40 to 50 youth every week coming in. Now, that was last year's numbers. Those numbers have gone up a little bit this year. Um, so going on to Matt Hugh, our, our praise team leader, um, kind of areas that he wanted to measure. He wanted to measure the overall influence of the praise team. Uh, two, we now, as a church, we have two complete worship teams, uh, including drums, all, all instruments, drums, bass, electric, acoustic guitars, keyboards, vocals, sound tech, over 20 people on our praise teams, um, at three services per week. Uh, they, they don't do the classic, the classic, but if you added their numbers in as well, three services per, per week plus one practice for 11 musicians and singers, that's 4,500 hours annually volunteered to lead worship. So when you see the people up here singing, and you see uh, Brian and, and, and Steve back there running sound and, and, vi and, uh, uh, and video. And you see all these guys. If you added up their volunteerism for the whole year, it's over 4,500 hours of volunteer, volunteerism that they, that they sacrifice in their lives. 4,500 hours at 550 people in attendance here per week. 550 people, and between those three services, that adds up to 28,000 hours of exposure to worship and, and, and scriptural teaching. 
28,000 hours of influence that's going on here at the way. My wife, Vicki, who, who is the leader of the women's ministry, in the five years since the way it has been, she's done uh, three studies per year, which is 15 studies. On average, there's 30 women per study. So if you, add, if you just take that simple math, that's 450 women, but it's not all different women. So even if 100 are doing multiple studies, that would leave about 350 different women that are doing Bible studies within this church. She and I together have done two marriage classes with an average of 30 couples in each class. So that's 60 couples that have been influenced for their marriage for the kingdom of God. Casey Snyder, who is our Ground Zero Fitness and Nursery Coordinator, uh, she and her team measured success by calories burnt collectively as a ministry. And, she, and they burned approximately, their team and the people that participated in the ministry burned approximately 21,000 calories a week, which is about six pounds of fat every week. And then, of course, she also is the nursery coordinator. Uh, nursery averages about 12 to 15 kids every week. Um, and, and we have 23 volunteers in our nursery. Now, again, if th those are that are actually there. Imagine, you know, they, they actually have a, a group of kids that come, but they don't come every week. And so those numbers are even higher. So while we may have 15 kids in nursery, I think our pool of kids is like 30 of kids. That, so if they all showed up on the same Sunday, that's how many kids we could have in our nursery. Um, so there, and then Mike Bropes, who's our prayer team leader, that prayer team, when you fill out those prayer cards, those those cards, that, and, and you put those in there, those just don't go off into cyberspace. There's a team and staff that pray for you. Well, Mike Bropes, the prayer team, they estimated, based on, on the prayer concerns that have come from you and the prayer requests that have come, that, that it, last year during the ministry, they, they offered up over 10,000 prayers on behalf of people. 10,000 prayers. Now, another thing they were called to do last year was lose weight collectively as a ministry and collectively as a ministry they lost over 250 pounds and that's still climbing so it's still improving they also write what's called prescription cards which is uh, the way that that works is, is sometimes the lord lays on their heart a word for somebody and they and they will actually uh, it, like a prescription like medication they'll actually write down a bible verse and like and, and they'll say here take this once a day for the next two weeks. Or they'll hand them a, a Bible verse and say, this is to be taken once a week for the next month. And they call those prescriptures. Well, they handed out over 200 of those to people within the church. Dave Wagner, our hospitality team, um, when you fill out those connection cards, what the, what the hospitality team does is they hand write a note. Many of you have received a handwritten note from the hospitality team saying, welcome, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're glad you're with us and, and all those things. But since, uh, as of last year numbers, they've done 228 of those handwritten notes to people. If you add up all of their, their meals that they participate in as a hospitality team, spring fling, Valentine's dinner, Easter pancake breakfast, celebration Sunday uh, in June, the pool party in July, fall festival in September, if you add all of those up since we began as a church, they as a ministry have served over 5,000 meals to people. 5,000 meals to people within the church. They also are very active in our Facebook. Uh, you know, if you like your encouraging word for the day on our Facebook site, our, our uh, Facebook reach or influence, I guess you could say, has grown from in 2011, it was 414 people a month, to now, or well, in 2014, it was 2,047 people a week. Is who that is who is, that's that's influence in our community. Marcy Milburn, uh, who's the leader of Journey 252 and also the director of the Well here at the church. Um, a couple of, of facts about her. Uh, in a in, uh, last ministry year, they averaged 60 to 70 children ages uh, three years to sixth grade on Sunday morning uh, with 17 volunteers 
They had a summer camp with 60 kids, in which they had 32 volunteers. And, uh, you know, and, and just, again, her pool of kids. So, so on an average Sunday, um, there's, I mean, now it's probably 75 or more, but her pool of kids is over 125. So if they all showed up, I mean, if just everybody showed up on the same day, you'd have 125 or more kids ages 3 to 6th grade running around this church on, 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 during the 1030 service. That, that's, that's amazing. And, and, and it just continues to grow. Uh, Marcy, uh, obviously, also she's the director of the well. And we have continued adult discipleship classes such as uh, the journey, uh, um, several, several classes. We had a, uh, last year we offered a ton of classes. We, we've kind of pulled back a little bit this year because we, offer, we offered systematic theology. May, never in my wildest dreams did I imagine that if we offered systematic theology here as a church, we'd have 30 people sign up for that to read and study a book that feels like it's that thick if you carry it around it's like one of those things that gets heavier by the minute but they're just hungry for it they just can't wait i we've been taking a break over the holidays and i hear people going man i can't wait till we get back to class i got so many questions they're just hungry for it and this is what's going on so these are things uh, adult people discipleship people are being educated they're being fed they're being fed and they're growing in their knowledge and their faith glenn deswart our, our deacon team those of you that serve on the deacons that come in they come in and they serve uh, they serve all the services in the morning and they, they they come in and they 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 collect they collect our offerings so that we can stay operational <laughs> but god bless the god bless the deacon teams jeremy masterson the leader of the the men's ministry um, they, they've, grown, uh, they've grown to an average of 15 to 20 men. They meet approximately six hours a month. And what he was most encouraged about was the number of men in men's ministry that are participating in other ministries. He saw men in the men's ministry stepping up in ministries such as children's ministry, worship, drama, jail ministry, prison ministry. Men, are, men aren't just, they're going and they're hanging out and they're learning about the Lord, but then they're stepping out and they're serving and they're going into places. How exciting is that? And how not always typical. But the men of this church, they're warriors, man. They go and they serve. And it's amazing to see what happens. I don't want to be a, I don't want to be a church of passive men. I want to be a church of kingdom tail kickers right warriors man we go out and we take ground for the kingdom of god in the name of jesus how cool is that and that's that 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 that's happening we got warriors here that that, that are serving the lord it's an amazing thing sarah van manen our our way cafe coordinator uh in in, in our last ministry year in the course of the year she ordered over two thousand cookies from high V, that doesn't even come close to counting the homemade cookies that our volunteers bring in and the homemade treats. I mean, it's just mind-boggling. I, I don't even know how many pounds of coffee we've gone through over the last year. Uh, well over 100 pounds of coffee. Maybe, I, I, I don't know, maybe 200 pounds. I, I don't know. I was going to try to figure that out, but I didn't have the time, nor really the interest, actually. But it'd be kind of an interesting thing to measure was the, the actual amount of coffee that we've been through. But that just continues to grow. Betty Sampson, our Director of Discipleship and Leadership Development. She's in charge of our partnership covenants. Uh, again, if you're new here, we don't offer memberships. We offer partnership covenants. Um, last year, at the end of our year last year, we had 159 families that are partnership coven that are covenant partners. That's 410 individuals, and that number has increased significantly, actually since then said this does not include a significant number of regular attenders who are not ready yet ready are not yet partners and that's if you're just a regular attender and you haven't signed a partnership covenant that's okay but think about the number of people that that if we had everybody sign a partnership covenant 
the numbers that would be there. I talked to you about spa groups. Our enrollment, our, our involvement in spa groups, we have 125 people within our church that are involved in spa groups. And actually, that number has increased as well. Um, I know a lot of spa groups have taken a break over the holidays. But when we resume, resume we'll have nearly 150 people involved in spa groups. Uh, so that number, that number just continues to grow as well. And kind of um, one thing just to note, uh, the, outreach, or the outreach team uh, kind of we, we kind of took a little a bit of a hiatus, but Ken Landgrebe, uh, he's, he's reloaded and ready for action and all kinds of things going on. Uh, and so as we enter into this new year, you're going to hear all kinds of things, uh, lots of plans for the outreach team. That's going to be resuming. Uh, we're excited about that. And then finally, the last, the last thing I want to share with you, it's kind of funny, uh, Jim Sampson, our facilities manager, uh, kind of very, he kind of found a unique way to measure success. Um, but first of all, just, just to kind of let you know about the activity here at the church, when, when things first began, we would have activity here maybe three or four times a week at various times, including, including the weekend services. Now, during the ministry year, there is something going on in the building every single day. Every day of the week, there's something going on, and sometimes there's two to six different things going on in the building every day. So this is how those things have grown. Now, something that he kind of measures, <laughs> he said he, what, his measurement for success is bathroom tissue. Early on, when the way began, he used to buy bathroom tissue in four packs. Now he gets it in 48 packs. <laughs> so we've, we've at least multiplied our tissue needs by ten, by by. 10 times. And he also said that our trash output has tripled depending on the week, sometimes even more. So these are, th again, this is just kind of that 10,000 foot view of what's going on here at the church. And this is what has been going on. So just in case you're sitting there thinking, well, what can one person do? Well, how about 600? What can 600 people do if they pull together and they say, it's not about us. It's about this town and this region. It's about our youth. It's about our people. It's about drug addicts. It's about crime. It's about it being an influence on a community. And you see what's happening. And folks, I'm telling you, we haven't seen anything yet. I mean, if we think these numbers are big and we're like, yay, great, wonderful, uh, you know, that's it. No, it's not. This is just the beginning. And, and, and you have to think, you have to think massive. What does Jesus want to do to this region? And what is he going to do through a group of people that are committed to serving him? And that's the way we have to have this mindset. We've got to quit playing church. It doesn't mean anything. As we play church and we gather together in a building playing church, people are dying. This community is failing Crime rates are going up. People are becoming addicted to drugs. Kids are committing suicide. They're hopeless. And if we as a church say, no, we're going to fight this. We're going to stand. We're going to stand in the name of Jesus. We're going to offer the truth. We're going to offer hope. We're going to offer love. Things change. Communities change. I hear people every so often, and, and please, because I know sometimes it gets discouraging and you get frustrated, but sometimes I hear people really criticizing Newton. Oh, this town. Well, what are you going to do about it? Are you going to sit there and complain? Or are you going to go to work? Or are you going to say, you know what? That, that's not good, but it's not the final chapter of the story. There's hope. There's more. There's more to it. How it is not now is not how it will be in the future in the name of Jesus Christ. Do we not believe that we bear the message that offers hope and new life? And that's who we have to be as a church. So let me kind of share you some vision for the future. How are we going to continue to, to, to continue what we're doing and move into the new things that God is leading us to? Let me give you a couple things as we go, as we go through and we kind of come to the end of this. 
in the future here at The Way, we are going to continue to reach out and fulfill our mission. Well, as I said, we'll be launching the outreach team to continue to, to add to our overall mission and activity and operations as a church, and we will we'll increase everything. We'll increase everything uh, with, with which, whatever the resources God gives us. We'll continue to build up and train leaders within this body. Uh, when you think of leadership, don't ever think of power. Think of influence. Leaders influence others. And so we, as a church, will be empowering people, according to the gifts of the Holy Spirit, to be leaders, to be vessels of influence, We'll continue to do that, whether it be through our, the well, our educational classes, whether it be through the men's ministry or the women's ministry, all the various things that we offer to help people grow in their knowledge and, and strengthen the Lord and be the leaders that God has created them to be. Probably one of our biggest announcements, and this is the one I'm probably the most excited about, you maybe have heard rumors, but at the end of this month, we will be presenting you, the congregation, with a set of plans for a building expansion. Uh, we've been working on this. We've actually hired an architect. We've been prayerfully working on this. Um, we've, got a great, we've got a great concept for what we're going to do to expand this building. Folks, we're tapped out. Four services, I don't have one more in me. The praise team, uh, you know, these four services, it, you know, something, it, it's, it's just, it's tapped out. Our parking, this building. Have you ever stopped to look at how small this building is? We got 600 plus people moving out through here every weekend, and and we're we're blessed to have it, but we're not going to get any bigger at this point. Maybe maybe little little pieces here and there, but for the most part, we're tapped out, and so we're looking at and prayerfully considering a building expansion. Now here's the kicker: it's not going to happen without your commitment on your sacrifice. So what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to ask yourself a hard question. How committed am I and how much do I think this is part of what God is doing here? Because there's no way to do it without sacrifice. There's no way. Because we are not going to build an expansion on this building unless the people of this church, the way, the body of Christ, here at the way, is committed to it. And I'll tell you, I'm a firm believer, if you aren't growing, you're dying. So it's, it's kind of a milestone as a church. What are we going to do as we push forward? We're going to be presenting you with these prints uh, by the end of the month. And then we are going to, we, we'll, we'll, we'll ask each of you to prayerfully consider a three-year commitment, financial commitment, to this project. And we'll just see what happens. So we're going to... We're going to roll the dice, we're going, to, we're going to trust the Lord, and we'll see what happens. But you need to be praying about what it is God's calling you to do in unison with the, with the mission here. So this building project uh, potentially will be coming up. That'll be on there. Um, we have uh, another thing that's in the future for us as a church is we'll be establishing ourselves as an autonomous church. Right now, we are, a, we are a campus ministry of Third Church in Pella. I know that sometimes people might think I'm kind of an independent rogue, and I have nobody that, that <coughs> supervises me or anything like that. I actually have, a, I have an executive team <coughs> that I'm answerable to, that, that supervises me, that takes care of me spiritually um, and prays for me. Uh, but uh, eventually, we will become autonomous, a standalone church, uh, and our denomination is the Reformed Church of America. Uh, and I, I don't make a big issue of our denomination. Um, I, I don't talk about it, but it is who we are. Historically and traditionally, we are part of the Reformed Church of America. And if you don't have a clue about what that means or what it is, uh, rca.org, and you can kind of check it out. But I will tell you that um, it's, not like, it's, not, it's, not the, it's not the top of our banner. We acknowledge the fact that we're part of a denominational family um, that is united theologically and traditionally and historically, um, but we will we have our own unique mission here at the way, um, and so but we will we will be establishing that uh, within the next couple years, two to three years, and then beyond that, 
our hope and our goal is, is to plant a church. I believe that, that part of being a Christian and being a part of a church is the flowing, is, is how the kingdom flows. It's like a river. It doesn't pool and stagnate. So we're not going to just continue to hoard and build and, and do all these things. That, that, that we do now to kind of serve our missional purpose. But in the future, we want to be a church that sends out people to, to continue to plant churches and advance this kingdom. And so that, that's, that's part of our DNA inherited from our mother church, third church. And, and if, you, if you ever remember me doing any kind of preaching on stagnation, you can't ever stagnate. The kingdom of God flows. So it's important that we as a people are a people that, that, that collectively and, and, and operationally that there's flow. So people rise up, and as the Spirit leads, they go out, and they start things, and they begin ministries. They rise up. Not everybody's called to do that, but some will be. And so that's the cycle in which we're going. So there is a snapshot of who we are as a church and who we are going to become in the future. The question for you is, are you a part of it? Because we want you to be. I'm going to end this, I'm going to end this message by reading for you um, a text, which is really uh, obviously a foundational text of this church, is John 14, 6. Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's one verse. But there's a, there's a section of Scripture which from the very beginning has been our foundational text as a church. And I want to read this for you. Um, and then this is what we're going to end on. But these are Paul's words. And he says, because we understand our fearful responsibility to the Lord, we work hard to, to persuade others. We work hard to persuade others. God knows we are sincere, and I hope you know this too. Are we commending ourselves to you again? No, we are giving you a reason to be proud of us so you can answer those who brag about having a spectacular ministry rather than having a sincere heart. If we don't have sincere hearts, then it's all for nothing. But as we have sincere hearts, amazing things happen. If it seems we're crazy, thus the term wavy, if it seems we're crazy, it's to bring glory to God. And if we're in our right minds, it's for your benefit. Either way, Christ's love controls us. Other translation says compels us. Oh, to be a church that's driven by the love of Christ just compels us. You know, we're not, we're not driven by our own selfishness. We're not driven by our, our own interests. But we are completely driven by the love of Jesus. Oh, to be that church. And there are so many of you here that are driven by a love of Jesus. And I just want to I, I, I encourage you. And there's some of you others here that, that maybe you need to stoke that fire a little bit. Because it's the Spirit of Christ that controls us, the love of Christ. Since we believe that Christ died for all, we also believe that we have died to our old life. He died for everyone so that those who receive this new life will no longer live for themselves. This is not American churchianity. This is the real deal. It's not about us. It's not about self-indulgence, selfishness. It's not about self-promotion. It's not about any of that stuff. It's about living for Christ. That's the real thing. And that's who we want to be as a church. It says that we, that we have all died to our old life. He died so everyone who, who receives this new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ who died and was raised from them. So we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. At one time, we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view, how differently we know him now. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. We offer new life in the name of Jesus. All of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. That's what we do. It's who we should be. 
For God was in Christ, reconciling the word to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. Ambassador is one of those terms today. We got, we got airplanes, we got, we got uh, internet, we got phones. An ambassador doesn't mean what it used to. 2,000 years ago, an ambassador would go to a country and he would represent the king from the country that he came from. And he would meet with, with other leaders of that country and he would have the full authority of the king. We are Christ's ambassadors. And what is our message God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. Come back to God. The way has been made. Come back. That's our message that we have as a church. That's the hope of the world. We speak for Christ. We plead, come back for God. For God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. This is who we are as a church. This is who we will continue to be. My prayer is, is that you'll be a part of this body. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word today. Lord, we thank you for your continual action to reach out and reach people. And Lord, what a privilege it is to be a part of that. So, Holy Spirit, we ask that you would unite us as only you can that you would empower us to be one body serving the kingdom of God. Lord, we think of this community and we think of this region and, and, and well beyond with this whole country. And we think about the discouragement, the hopelessness, the depression that people are experiencing. And Lord, it is time more so than ever for your church to rise up and be your ambassadors. So, Lord, may the way, may we be your ambassadors. May we be a church that is true to your great commission. Lord, there are many churches out there. My prayer is for them as well, that we all would be empowered and that we could take ground in your name, Lord Jesus, for the kingdom of God. We pray this in your name, Lord. Amen. Amen.